Hi guys, it's me, Ria, and this is another episode of Bunker. This podcast has been following Japanese businesses and culture and society around Aotearoa, and this week I'm going to be talking about Tanabata and a Kintsugi class that I attended at Masu this year. Tanabata is a holiday in Japan taken on the 7th of July every year. And in some regions, it's also celebrated on August 7th, because that's technically closer to the 7th day of the 7th month, according to the lunar calendar. Tanabata is also known as the Star Festival, and is based on the Chinese legend where two stars, Altair and Vega, who are in love, are separated by the Milky Way. The two literal star-crossed lovers are finally able to meet on the day of Tanabata. Vega also called Princess Orihime, and Altia, also known as the cowherder Hikoboshi, fall in love and neglect their duties, which angers the Sky King, the princess's father. So the Sky King separates them with a heavenly river, or in this case, the Milky Way. But when the Sky King sees how upset his daughter is, every year he decides to allow them to meet once on Tanabata. Now, in Japan, there's a Tanabata tradition of writing a wish on a piece of paper, and these are known as Tanzaku. The Tanzaku is then hung on a bamboo tree. In this case, a bamboo tree is used because of the great heights they can grow to, sending the wishes upwards towards the heavens where they can be granted by deities. Just as the two stars wished to meet, Hanging our wishes on Tanabata is a way of hoping that all of our wishes will come true. Like many of the celebrations in Japan, Tanabata is celebrated in festivals countrywide. It is one of the five traditional festivals in Japan known as Goseku. It was brought over from China and was first observed in Japan by the ancient imperial court. It was first celebrated by Empress Korgen and imperial court aristocrats in 755 and it then became popular during the Edo period in the 17th to late 19th century. Growing up in Aotearoa I didn't often see celebrations of Tanabata outside of close-knit Japanese communities and Japanese classes so I was delighted this year when I saw that a well-known Japanese restaurant in Auckland CBD, Masu, were pairing with Haku Vodka to celebrate Tanabata with a Kintsugi workshop. In 2020, Rotorua Library also celebrated the festival, which organisers Hiroe and Paul Howell have been running for 11 years at a different venue. It was supported by the Rotorua Multicultural Council, and Hiroe said it was a staple for the Japanese community in Rotorua to celebrate their culture and traditions. Japanese restaurants throughout the country are also known for their celebration of Tanabata, often inviting their customers to write wishes and hang them within the restaurant's interior. Earlier this year in Wellington, the Japanese festival set their theme for the event as Tanabata and Matariki, celebrating the cultures of both Japan and New Zealand in a fun tradition which is held annually. The event in Wellington had a whopping 20,000 people attend. Anyway, back to Masu. So I was thrilled to see a celebration of a festival in one of the busiest restaurants in Auckland CBD. So I decided it would be a great opportunity to one, learn kintsugi, and two, share with you a celebration of Japanese heritage. Masu is a robata restaurant, meaning they tend to cook with charcoal and in a barbecue style. It's located on Federal Street next to Auckland's Sky City and Sky Tower and is owned by chef Nick Watt who worked at Michelin star Nobu in the past and brought that training of Japanese cuisine to Auckland City Centre. The event involved a one and a half hour workshop of kintsugi and a set menu which was exciting because I've never been to Masu. The food was good like a western twist on traditional Japanese cuisine with lots of flavour and the cocktails made with Haku spirits were excellent. Haku Vodka comes from the spirit company Santori, a Japanese company founded in 1899, known widely for their whiskey. Haku Vodka is made from 100% Japanese white rice, 
and you'll see Santori's other spirits at many bars and restaurants around Aotearoa, including Roku Gin, Santori Whiskey, and even other drinks such as V, Ribena, Maker's Mark, and Jim Bean. The Kintsugi workshop at Masu was run by Emma Frost and was not the most traditional style of Kintsugi, but certainly a good version to learn in a short time period and for beginners. We were each given our own artfully broken ceramic piece to repair, which we got to keep at the end of the workshop. So, what is Kintsugi, you might be wondering? Well, Kin is Japanese for gold, and Tsugi is Japanese for repair. So essentially, kintsugi is repairing something with gold. It's also known as kintsu kuroi, and it is a centuries-old way of repairing broken pottery. Japan has some of the oldest pottery traditions known to man, which came from the Jomon people, an ancient civilization from Japan that dates back to approximately 13,000 BC. The pottery from these people dates back to that same period, with pots that feature this coil-like patterning that resembles plaited rope. Obviously, it was much later than this that Kintsugi began, but I speak of the Jomon pottery as it was the beginning of a rich ceramic practice in Japan that has become one of the greatest and most discussed in the world. The exact origins of Kintsugi are unknown, however it seems to have begun during the rise of tea ceremony, which was during the later 16th century. Unlike restoration techniques which work to hide the damage caused to an object, Kintsugi celebrates the history of the objects and beautifies its imperfections. Using lacquer, a form of resin that is taken from tree sap, the pieces of ceramics are rejoined and then coated in powdered gold. The use of resin for repair has been done for millennia, yet the addition of gold is only centuries old. Kintsugi fits in with the Japanese philosophy of wabi-sabi, which focuses on finding beauty and imperfections because it is natural to grow and decay. Another philosophy in Japan, mushin, which is a mental philosophy derived from martial arts and Zen Buddhism, is known as meaning no mind, which is a form of detachment that results in accepting fate and change in life. These philosophies assist in understanding Kintsugi as they describe why the flaws in celebration of an object's history are honoured. Some say Kintsugi dates back to Shogun of the 15th century Ashikaga Yoshimasa, who had broken his favourite tea bowl. This is a probable beginning for the craft because Yoshimasa is known for being the Shogun who created a cultural and arts renaissance that was based heavily on philosophies of Zen Buddhism bringing a resurgence to the likes of tea ceremony, ikebana and no theatre. When craftsmen in China couldn't repair Yoshimasa's bowl, he instead asked a Japanese craftsman who turned the bowl into an artwork by filling the cracks with lacquer and gold. So, the technique we were taught at Masu, I'm sure is not as intricate as that of Yoshimasa's craftsman, but it is a quicker contemporary version of the historic tradition. These new techniques have gained international popularity in crafts communities, likely due to their aesthetic appeal, because everybody loves something shiny and gold, right? So first, you smooth out the edges of the broken ceramic piece, getting rid of the sharpness. Then, Emma made us mix some epoxy resin with gold flakes, and you apply this to the edges needing to stick together. We then held the two pieces together for 5 to 10 minutes until it had set. And this actually seemed to be the hardest part of this Kintsugi process, because your arms get tired when you're holding the pieces together. And when the glue is holding, but not fully dry, using a paintbrush, a dry paintbrush, you press gold leaf to the exposed glue, and this gives a golden seal around the edges. Then you repeat this process with each broken piece, applying each piece one at a time. Afterwards, you take a large dry paintbrush and you brush off the excess gold leaf and voila, kintsugi. It was really fun and it was quick and the food was great and so it was an amazing night out. 
They also gave us little tanzaku to write our tanabata wishes on and we could place them on the bamboo tree in the restaurant. So look out for your tanabata celebrations in your area next July or maybe August and check out some of the kintsugi workshops which are being held around Aotearoa. While I was making this podcast, I have seen workshops being held in various places throughout Auckland, Wellington, Palmy, and Christchurch. And Emma Frost, who taught the class that I went to, actually will travel around the country to teach similar workshops. Now, I wasn't endorsed by Emma or Masu for this episode. I just felt like it was fun to do a small little mini-sode about a fun Japanese event that I went to this year. I also think that there are probably people teaching a more traditional style of kintsugi around New Zealand, or if you're feeling brave, you could order the things you need to try kintsugi yourself from home. Now, I wanted to also say that there are classes for other types of Japanese ceramics that you can attend all throughout New Zealand. There's also tea ceremony groups and things like that, which you can go to. We can enjoy these little bits of Japanese craft practice and learning something new. So that's the end of today's episode. It is a little short one, um, but I will see you next time when I'm going to be talking about some Japanese kiwis who are growing Japanese produce in Aotearoa. Bye!